Hey everybody. What we're going to do today is update our multi-group confirmatory factor analysis examples to the current era. So this is an update to my um, structural equation modeling course. And it includes an example that I would use in class for multi-group confirmatory factor analysis. And this course is taught in Levon with the Bojan Flower Latent Variable Modeling Book and the Brown Applied Confirmatory Factor Analysis book. And so it's part of an entire series on instru structural equation modeling. And it's an update because the SIM tools package took away one of my all time favorite functions. And I also wanna add just a little bit on equivalence testing, which has come out in the last several years. So welcome to the update, let's get started. Uh, some assumptions that I have uh, if you're watching this video is that you know a little bit of something about structural equation modeling. Perhaps you've watched the rest of my courses or um, have uh, learned a little bit but not enough. And you've got a little bit of an idea about multigroup models. If you don't, I have a lecture that explains more of the technical concepts behind them. And you know a little bit of Levon syntax. And obviously, you know R. So that's where I'm starting today. So if those things aren't true, I would tell you to back up and watch some of the other videos on structural equation modeling first, or the lecture over multigroup models. But let's get started. The entire purpose of a multigroup model is to really test equality constraints. And so in previous examples, we've kind of talked about how you can set paths in Levon to equal to each other. So if you're trying to control for um, let's say you only have two uh, measured variables on a latent, that doesn't identify a model. So you have to set both of those to the same parameter estimation or your model doesn't have enough degrees of freedom. Right? Or even if it does have enough degrees of freedom, it's not technically identified. So what I could do is for each of the measured variables, remember here on the left hand side, we're defining a latent variable equals tilde um, is, you know, approx this variable approximately predicts um, our two measured variables. So this is a cheese example. <laughs> so we've got feta cheese and Swiss cheese. But since we only have two of them, we would might label both of those parameters with an A to indicate that they should be estimated in the same way. So those two loadings will be estimated at the same value. You can also do this by group. Although the way you do this structurally is a little different. So we wouldn't need to, for each measured variable, give it a, the same label. We'd give each measured variable a different label and tell it to constrain the model by group. So we're gonna build a bunch of equality constraints and we can do this one at a time ourselves or we can use the sim tools package and actually that needs to be updated to say we can use the uh, a measurement invariance package that I was helpfully pointed to, and I will show you how that one works. So we're gonna ditch SIM tools, although it is still a great package, and use a different package that will actually automate a lot of this for us. But I'll also show you what it's doing, so if you don't wanna quite follow the steps I'm going to show, you can figure out how to do them on your own. So we can actually do this entire thing in Levon, um, I just think this extra package is handy and kind of helps make what could be a very tedious process a little quicker. So I'm using the same example I've been using, uh, the resiliency 14 scale. It is a one factor measure of resiliency. So some of the options that we could do at the structural level of our model were not really available because there is no factor correlation, um, but we could do if the factor variances are the same across groups. And we will talk about latent means at the end. So I'm gonna load up Levon. It tells me all the time that Levon is beta software. <laughs> so we'll just ignore that. Uh, I'm also gonna load this data set. All of this is online on our OSF page. And the data set has gender, race collapsed into white, black, and other, and then the resiliency scale items. So there's 14 of them. And this is based on a research paper that we published looking at the resiliency scale for these exact issues. So one thing I'm going to do is clean up the sex column 
because it's currently, as you can see here, ones and twos. That's not very helpful because the output will get labeled with the group label if you put it in there. So I know that one is men and two is women because I made the data set. There's actually a mysterious three. And so by not including that as a level, it will actually get dropped as an NA value, which is okay because I don't, three was not something we actually used. So we didn't actually have another. There's just a weird th couple of threes in there. And as normal, the dog has decided to shake her head violently and snort. So please enjoy the dog pacing around the room while we play this game. All right, so do we have enough people? It's always a concern that in a multi-group model, once you start to split the data, that you have enough people in each subgroup to accurately estimate your parameters. And I would say a 250 or so in each one, we're doing pretty good. Right, we don't really want this to be below 100, and obviously larger samples are better for structural equation modeling in general. And then this next little subset line right here, all I'm doing is dropping the NAs. This solves some problems where once you start to use some of these extra packages, if you have missing values on your grouping variable, it will tell you every time it happens. So you'll just get line after line of like, sex is missing and it has missing data. So it's easier if you drop them at the beginning. You may not be able to though, if you're wanting to take some of this data and merge it back in and use it for something else. But since this analysis is specifically focusing on just gender differences, I'm going to drop my six or so people who don't have that variable. Now, if you've been following along, we've talked a lot about the CFA function and how you have to define a model, you have to define a data minimally. Um, the new thing we're going to add is this mean structure. We haven't really done any models where we've estimated mean structure, unless you're watching this out of order. And what mean structure does is it adds intercepts and means to the model. Generally, these are not estimated. So in a normal CFA, you do not estimate the item intercept for each measured variable and the latent mean. But for these types of models, you do want to add that. So we're gonna add that in. And the way to do that is to add mean structure equals true to the overall CFA argument, CFA function. And so we wanna turn this on for the first model that we run because all of the subsequent models will include this. And so we need to make sure when we run this first model, it doesn't blow up. So remember, we're going to define our model syntax. So we're going to say the resiliency factor, and we're just going to call it RS, and predicts the 14 measured variables here. Okay. So we've defined that model. We're going to create a fitted model using the CFA function. We say model equals overall model, the one we just built. So this is how it knows what picture to build. The data set is master, because I didn't really screen this for outliers. I probably should, but in this example, we're not going to do data screening. And then we'll add this new argument, mean structure equals true. So let's see what that looks like. When I run a summary function, remember the first argument is the fitted model, standardized equals true, which will give me the standardized solution, r squared equals true, which is helpful to see if I have Haywood cases in the general measurement of our variables. Fit measure, fit dot measure equals true so I can see the fit indices. Now when you run these models, there will be a ton of output. Levon already gives you a ton of output. Multiply that by group and by model. We're gonna run 10 of them, so lots of output. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time scrolling through all these outputs. You can look at them yourself. Um, but in general, I can see it's a pretty good model. Our goodness of fit indices are good. Our badness of fit indices are also good, which is a weird thing to say, but they're also within a range that we would find acceptable. And then what we'd wanna see is something new. So if you've just run a regular CFA before, this is the new part. Okay. So we have our, 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 where it says latent variable, this is where we get our factor loadings. Right? And we're gonna mostly look at the standardized, completely standardized solution and those are all very strong loadings onto that factor. Um, and this is a pretty good scale, very high inter item intercorrelations. That's why I like working with it. 
But now we've got this new thing, which is the intercepts. For these, I actually find it best to look at the regular estimate because this is not standardized. For factor loadings, standardized solution is a little bit easier to read because you're sort of usually used to looking at EFA. Um, here, I this intercept is the item average. So this is an estimation of the average score of that item okay, by the intercept. So remember the intercept in a regression equation is the um, y mean, right? so where it crosses zero. And so I can see just kind of right away which items people tend to go more ceiling effects, so 12 here, and which ones they tend to go more towards the middle. Okay. This is a one to seven scale. And so we're, we're mostly hanging out around four and some that push a little more into the agree category. And so these, I, there's no real rule of thumb here. It depends on the scale of the data, but I can interpret these a little bit easier for myself. So I know that these are all, these look like what the item averages for the scale should be. You'll still get your error variances. You wanna make sure none of these are negative for Haywood cases. And then down here, we'll also get our R squared for each of our measured variables. Uh, and then here, these are all pretty good. So essentially here, you also don't want a negative. And I think Levi mostly will not show you negatives. It will mostly just give you a big NA because it's calculating these. And if your variance is negative, I think it shows up down here as, as NA. It's been a while since I've looked at the new output for Haywood cases, um, but I'm almost positive. Either way, you don't want it to be negative because R squared should not be negative. Once I have determined that that model hasn't exploded and it's probably okay, which is pretty good, I am going to build myself a table and just start sticking in my fit indices. Now this is not the best formatted table I have ever made in my life, but it's a quick and dirty way to show you the output kind of summary from each of the models we're gonna run. Okay. So to do that, this is how I do them in my research papers. I build myself a little matrix with as many rows and columns as I'm interested in. I give my little matrix some column names. So what model am I running? What's the chi-square? What's the degrees of freedom? I could also include P, but we all know, hopefully, that chi-square is upwardly biased with large sample sizes. So having a p-value that's not significant really is impractical. But for some reason, people still really love chi-square, so we're going to stick it in there. Um, confirmatory, uh, no. Yeah, the CFI. It's not the confirmatory fit index. Maybe it is. Okay, I've lost in my brain what CFI means, but we're gonna use the CFI. A RIMC and SRMR. Uh, so there are other ones you could include. You can include AIC, BIC, pick your favorite flavor. These to me are the sort of minimum three for what we're doing, um, but every field's a little different. From that, I'm going to take the, oops, sorry. I didn't mean to click, take the fit measures here and tell it to only show me the ones I want, All right? So remember the fit measures function will give you an entire alphabet of fit indices. And here we're just gonna take chi-square, degrees of freedom, CFI, RIMC, and SRMR. Okay. Cable is a really pretty package from in that's in knit R. It's um, a function in knit R that prints out pretty tables. So here's my unfancied cable. And we can see that our fit statistics are pretty good. All right, so let's look at a picture real quick. So if I use the simplot library and I don't do anything to this picture, I do the most basic picture I can do. You can do simpaths, right? The model, the fitted model. What labels here is the numbers. So I told it to print out the standardized solution and give me a tree layout. And really there are so many things I could do to this to make it more readable, but this is just a quick and dirty. Did it make the model I expected? This is also very helpful if you have multiple latent variables. So what we see is, is there is actually an intercept on the uh, latent variable, but it's estimated at zero. This is on purpose. Here are the little triangles. This will be new if you haven't done these. The triangles represent the intercept. Remember the double-headed arrows represent either variance or error. The triangles here are intercepts. So here are all of our standardized intercepts. And then we've got our error variances, are the little looped arrows here, and then our uh, factor loadings. 
So that looks like the model I wanted. Great. Now let's get into the multi-group part. So the package I'm going to use is equal test in my, instead of sim simplot or sim tools, sim tools. So many packages with the same name. Sim paths will give you gorgeous pictures. Sim tools has some great tools that you can use to do lots of structural equation modeling things that complements Levon. Equal test MI is actually designed to do equivalence testing for measurement and variance, but we can also make it do the type of measurement and variance testing that we want to do. So we're going to use that package um, and shout out to Alyssa <laughs> for uh, re giving me this recommendation. Now it looks a little scary at first, but don't be scared. So the function is eqmi.main. I am telling it to save so I can use it. You do want to do that. Even though it prints out all of the output and it never ends, um, you do want to save it so that we can use it to add to our table and to look at. So the first set of arguments are Levon arguments. So this is like essentially the CFA information here at the top. So we'll do model equals overall dot model, data equals master, mean structure equals true. The only thing we've really added is this group function. So this top part is a CFA. We could completely ditch this package and just run CFA on those first four lines and get round one of the output. However, the thing I like about this package is that it runs pretty much all of them for you and, um, and more that I don't even need to use and I can just look at them. But I will also show you in the background what this is doing to the CFA function. So if you don't want to use this package, you can actually do this manually yourself. Or if you want to do a different kind of order of operations, which make more sense here in a second, you can kind of know what's going on. Okay. All right, so group equals sex. This is what it tells it to group on. So you don't have to have two, you can have more than two. It gets really crazy once you have four or more groups. Um, generally these are often paired, you know, dichotomous kinds of outputs, but you can do more. Down here at the bottom is more of what the package does. So output equals both. I just tell it to print both because it doesn't hurt me to print um, both outputs. And so what this does is it groups things by either mean level structure or covariance level structure. And this is one way to think about this sort of, um, equivalence testing in structural equation models is to think about the mean structures versus covariance structures. Other people talk about this as like measurement models versus structural models. Sometimes people talk about structural models being the population heterogeneity question. Uh, I'm going to talk about it uh, matching the Brown Applied book because that's what I see most in my field. Well, we're going to mostly focus on the, the um, measurement model. And so I just tell it to print out everything because then I can at least see what it's doing. At the moment, we're going to turn equivalence.test off. And at the end, I'll show you what happens when you make it true. Uh, Adjust.remc actually is, tr is um, mostly for the equivalence test part. And I think true is default, but there's a, uh, a paper on whether or not one should use that, that I can link in the notes. Um, Projection equals true. I wrote C notes. I don't even remember anymore what I was doing. So let's look it up. Okay, so it's eq dot main. So apparently I didn't trust myself to remember what it was. <laughs> Projection. Um, ah, so this is where we can get information about the latent factor means. So um, this is a specific type of test that one can use to te determine if the latent uh, means are equal, even if the equality of intercepts or scalar variance does not hold. Okay. So hold on to that thought, come back to it later, and I turned off Bootstrap for right now. Okay. All right. So at the moment, it told me I'm not going to do this adjusted RIMC thing. Um, because you did not actually ask for equivalence testing, which is fine. So it gives you a ton 
of output. Oh my goodness. So it tells me my covariance structure and then gives me some models in the order it thinks that you should look at them. And then gives you some difference tests. Um, and then gives you the mean structure options and the order that you might look at those. And it gives you some tests. Mostly we're going to ignore this. So watch me ignore it. Moving on. So if I follow the, the steps that I've taught in the last, in the lecture video, what I'm going to do is look at each group separately first to see if each group fits. This is considered generally, it's, it's not configurable invariance yet, but it's kind of this idea like if one group totally blows up, then they probably have completely different fits. So we want to make sure that each group kind of individually runs okay. Um, because it might be that in an overall model, one group is masking how bad the other group is. And so we've got all of our models saved, so we're just gonna pull the ones we want. And I, like I said, I'm using uh, Brown's terminology from the Applied Confirmatory Factor Analysis book. However, once you kind of understand what all the steps are, you can actually do them in any order you see fit. If you can convince a reviewer, that's a good idea. The nice thing here is that all of these models are saved and it's as if we ran a CFA for all of them. This is why I like was like, once I finally figured this package out, was like, this is great. Um, I don't have to write the code for it, it's actually run it for me. So let me kind of show you um, the structure. Sorry, Markdown displays very oddly when you have a big output sometimes. So here's the first model that I ran. And what happens is this is a list that includes the equivalence testing part, the projection latent means part, and the conventional SEM, basically. Underneath that, it's got the Levon output for all of the different models that it ran. And so this actually ran a, was 10 or 11 different Levon models. And so you can treat this particular line as a saved CFA. And so we can run summary on that. We can run um, sim paths on that. We can run fit measures. Anything that you can do on a normal saved Levon object, you can do on this. The tricky part is getting to it. So I save this as multigroup.model because I save all my fitted models. Well, I actually should have saved it as dot .fit, right? If I'm going to be consistent here. But this multigroup fit here, you hit the dollar sign. And then I'm going to say, okay, I want the conventional sim. You hit the dollar sign again. I want that Levon output. Hit the dollar sign one more time to see the different options. So I'm going to pick the first one. And then this is where you would actually switch to at symbols. Okay. So you can look at the call, the timing, the parameters, the data, the sample stats. So this is all these different pieces. But at this point in this very long name, this is where I can do summary. Um, fit measures, parameter estimates, etc. So let's go back over here. So that's what this giant thing is. So it pretty much stays the same to the last dollar sign here. And so I got fit.configural.g1. This is for group one. Unfortunately, I don't think the naming is not is not very good here because it never prints the name of the group. It does later, but not here. So I just had to look at the number of observations to know which group it is men alphabetically come up first so i think and they're number one in the group when we labeled them earlier so i think that's why they came up first but that's not true later so pay attention to your sample sizes so i run this summary the same way i run all of my summaries so model the fitted model standardized true r squared true fit measures true and i would just look at this like i looked at all of the rest of them so we just kind of come through Check out right now how there's this big blank spot here. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Kind of look, this is the men's model. Okay. No negative variances, no Hayward cases. Excellent. Moving on. We do the same thing, but now it's G2 for group two. So now I'm looking at the women's model. I know it's women because it's 266, so there's a little bit more. Okay. If I'm paying attention, I can tell that maybe my women's model is not as good. But it's not terrible either. Just keep scrolling. I'm mainly here just checking. Negative variances? Nope. R squared? Looks good. Now what do I want to do with that overall? Well, I want to combine those two into my fit table. Just so I can see them together. 
And this literally is the same code as earlier. I just switched out the model name here. Okay. I have some problems getting this to highlight well, but here where it says fit measures. And so it's that same big old long model name from the summary function. And I told it to just print out the five we're interested in. So I did that for men and did that for women. And the main other thing that I'm changing here on this table is what row it's going into. So the first one went into row one. Remember it's rows, comma, columns. This is row two and this is row three. So now it's printing out. Um, there are probably better ways to do this, but this way works for me. <laughs> so if it works for you, great. If, it's, if you know a better way, let me know and we'll do a video on it. So um, here I can see when I look at the numbers that the men's model is a little bit better than the women's model. Okay. So the CFI is just a touch better. Um, but then the chi-square for the women's model is lower, so it's kind of like a mixed bag. They're okay, but they're still well within range. Now, expect fit indices usually drop when we split the data because we're kind of estimating from less people. Um, remember, the degrees of freedom in these models have nothing to do with people. They um, about the number of free parameters. Um, but generally, when you when you lower the sample size, fit can degrade doesn't always but in these particular models what you'll usually see is a small drop in fit when you split the sample when you split into group one and group two so mainly here we're looking for things no haywood cases um and things don't really drop dramatically i don't know that i have a good answer for what's dramatic <laughs> um there are some rules of thumb about differences between models but those are applied usually in the next set of steps Now, what we want to do is run our actual invariance steps. So first we're going to do is configure all invariance. Remember the configure all invariance is that the picture of the data is the same. So it's that same one factor model. Now I could probably guess this is going to be okay because each of the individual models where the groups were totally separated ran fine. Here, what we see is we're going to pancake them together. And so in all these videos, I have to talk about food because it's my thing. And so what we're doing is we're stacking them together. This is why I think it's like pancakes. Um, we've got, you know, model one and model two. And I don't know how American this is, but we're going to um, stack those two on top of each other and make sure they're at least both pancakes. And one of them is not a Belgian waffle or from the summer, I got to enjoy um, the Netherlands great poffertees, which are little tiny pancakes. So we want to make sure that these are not tiny pancakes and a big pancake. You want the picture of the data to be the same for each group. In the saved equivalence testing output, that step is called fit.combine.groups, which is I think a great name for it, because this is the step where you combine the groups. Otherwise, it's all the same. And I'll show you in just a second how I knew it was which one it was. So I would scroll through this output. Won't spend a whole lot of time on these because they're going to be very similar across all of them. But again, no, no Haywood cases uh, apparent. But check it out. First, we get group one, which is women. So it switched which group was group one, which is a little weird. Um, scrolly, scrolly, scrollies. And then here's group two. So you, now we can see the labels that we added earlier. So now it's real clear whose output is whose. But these two are nested together. So this is not um, group one printed and then group two printed. This is both of them stacked on top of each other where they had to have the same picture. Okay. Now when we used the group one and group two output a second ago, we didn't change the models. They do have the same picture, but this is nested together in the same um, one model and not two separate models. And one way you can see that once we add the fit indices to our tables, the degrees of freedom. So you notice now the degrees of freedom have doubled because we've taken that overall model and placed them on top of each other. At the moment, we don't have any good comparison points here. We just have to kind of say, well, this model fits within the rules of what is a good fitting model according to fit statistics. So moving on. Okay. After this step, we'll have something to compare against. So this is the, the model with which the next step will be compared against. 
And so we're going to do kind of like a sequential testing analysis. So how did I know that that was the right one? Well, there are two places that one can change things in a, in a model here. We could change things in the model definition itself. So we could add more, we could add some labels where we set things to equal. We could add another latent variable. We could add another predictor, et cetera. Or we can change things within the CFA parameters. And that is where the magic is happening. So I didn't run this, um, but what's happening is that in that CFA, here's the original, overall.model, data equals master, mean structure equals true, group equals sex. Okay. So this is the configural model. This is what you would expect it to look like if you were running the configural model. Okay. So I had to figure out which model had that pattern. The nice thing is that it saves the call. So at call here tells me what it told R to run. Okay. Um, the bad thing is that it prints out all the data. <laughs> but now I can see that my model hasn't changed. So this is the same model definition I used a minute ago. It does unfortunately print out all of the data. <laughs> so I'm gonna scroll past all of that. Do, do, do. And then here's the interesting part at the bottom. So it says group equals sex, mean structure equals true. Great, I defined those. Group dot equal is blank, which is good because I didn't want that yet. Run a sim model. And then all of the rest of these are um, the Levant defaults. So I didn't really set any of these. So I was looking specifically for the model that had the call where it had group and nothing in this group dot equal. And so that's how I figured out. Plus the name combined groups helped. <laughs> so this is the configural invariance one. And this is how I knew what it was doing. If you don't want to run this function, you could run it like this. Okay, this would be the configural invariance CFA option. The next step would be metric invariance. So metric invariance constrains the factor loadings. So remember, we're going to slowly add more and more rules that this model has to follow to say that it's invariant. And remember that invariant means not different. Okay. So now I've said, well, they at least have the same picture. Now, do they have the same loadings? Is the relationship between my latent variable and my measured variables the same for both groups? And so this really tests if all of the items are still useful for every group. So do they have the same weight towards the latent variable? Okay. So here we can see our number of observations, women and men. Again, it kind of flipped them randomly. Um, we'll actually gain degrees of freedom as we go because as we add constraints, we're estimating less parameters because before both groups got to be estimated on their loadings. Now only one loading gets estimated for both of them. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Here's the part I wanted to prone out. So you'll see that it's added these new little letter numbers here. So this is P2, this is P14. It just doesn't print it out. So it's now added a label to the model um, definition for us in the background that constrains RS2 for women here. Do, 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 do to all the same value for RS2 for men. So I have 1.232, 1.232. So now the estimates are exactly the same because okay. we force them to be the same by adding this to the model definition, but that is done for you automatically. Okay. So I could manually write a model definition that had these to be equal, but this is what the group function with some group equality constraints does. Okay. So all the rest of this looks good. Let's look at what happened with the model. Okay. So I plugged in fit.metric. I'm sorry, I didn't talk about that on the last slide. Let me back up. So the model here is called fit.metric, which made it pretty clear to me this was metric invariance, but we can prove this in a second. Okay. So we're adding our fit.metric to it, and let's check it out. So there are a couple of different criteria one can use to determine if this model is invariant in comparison to a configural model. Um, essentially, is it still a good fit by constraining this? So even though we've squeezed the model, does it still fit well? Some people recommend a difference in chi-square. 
Um, so we could subtract here and do 167 minus 154, um, 545 minus 530, test that against a chi-square value of whatever. But generally that has not been found to work very well because of the known problems with chi-square. Another recommendation is to use a difference in um, CFI and um, the difference of at least 0.01. So if the difference is larger than 0.01, it's not invariant, aka not equal. If the difference is 0.01 or less, it is invariant or it is equal. I've seen some modifications to this. People are still kind of arguing. So you'd have to predefine what you expect that to mean. Some people talk about difference in RIM-C. I've mostly stuck with differences in CFI. And at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about the newer equivalence testing ideas. If I look at the difference in CFI here, there's none. So I would say these two models are the metric model holds and that the loadings are invariant, meaning they're equal for both groups. Okay, now they're not perfectly the same, but they're close enough that if I did little t-tests, we would not see any differences in the loadings. How did I know that that's what that was? If I do the at call again, what I am expecting it to have done is add this group dot equal loadings, which is Levon's way of saying, constrain the loadings between each group to equal. Okay, so this is the way that we would be run in our CFA if we were doing these completely separate steps. And then once I get past all the data here, I can see group dot equal equals loadings. So if you aren't sure what a particular model is doing, because there are 10 or 11 of them, uh, do this little at call at the end of it and look at what its uh, options are here for group dot equal. Okay. And the Levon webpage explains what each one of these is. And loadings here is equality in the loadings. So it's pretty obvious. They get weird names later. Um, there was something else. <laughs> nope, forgot. So, must not be important. So this uh, one, metric.fit, is our loadings one. Okay. Um, or fit.metric. And it helps that this is a name that many people use for the loading step, is metric invariance. Okay. The next one I'm going to do is scalar invariance. Scalar invariance tests if the item intercepts are the same. So you notice what we're moving on. We've gone from pictures to loadings to intercepts. And so we're really working on the measurement model here. Are the pieces of the structure of the model the same? So every item uh, appears to have the same relationship to its factor. Now, are the item intercepts, do they start in the same place? So are people to averages on these questions the same? And this is a really interesting question as well, because what it tells me is that it, people might have the same slope, essentially, the same relationship to their factor, but have a very different starting point. So it might be that women have a lower resiliency, picking on myself, I guess, um, than men, but the relationship of that question to my overall resiliency is the same. So this tells me kind of where each item starts and if that start is the same place for each group. So we actually did this analysis with whites and blacks and this could be a very interesting question is that that one group has a higher resiliency and therefore has higher outcomes even though the relationship of resiliency to its factor is the same. That rant over. Let's scroll and see where I added a new constraint. And so I know that I'm getting the intercepts. Okay. Sorry, let me scroll back up. First of all, it's called scalar invariance and the fit.scalar made this a little obvious. But if you are brand new to this, maybe that wasn't obvious. So scalar invariance is for intercepts. And I can see that it added the, the constraints here on the intercepts. So now I have... Um, Loadings and intercepts. So we're adding them as we go. You don't turn them on and off, you, you add as you go. It's like adding, it's like a hierarchical regression where you're adding uh, items to the equation. Okay. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Just make sure we don't have any negatives, which at this point, hopefully not. Um, but it looks pretty good. So let's see how that fits. So I'm gonna add fit.scalar to my model here. Again, we could do the subtraction 
but my CFI has really not changed. So it's 0 0.007. And so I would say that this is also uh, an invariant step. So the intercepts are equal between men and women on this scale. Excellent. I promise we will break the model so you can see what happens when you break it and that'll be this next step. Uh, and then just proof that this actually is doing what I think it's doing. What we should see is loadings and intercepts together. So we've added them. Remember this is additive. It's at the very bottom of the call. I'm sorry, this print's just crazy. Group dot equal is loadings and intercepts. Okay, so that was just proof to me that this was the model I was expecting. If you didn't want to use this function, this code up here, obviously without the number symbols, is how you would run this exact same step. Now, this next step is the one where it kind of diverges from the listed steps in the function. And so what we're going to use is uh, strict invariance. So strict invariance means the residuals or the error for each item is the same across groups. So, so look here, because uh, I mean, there's, there's a good reason also to do mean structure versus covariance structure. But I like these sort of steps because it's really focusing on the measurement model. So I have kind of worked my way down a tree diagram of this model, right? I've done loadings, I've done intercepts, now I'm gonna do residuals. What this one tells me is if their variance around, uh, around the item is the same as well. And so if one group has larger variance than the other, that means there's just more variability in their answers. And so that tells you something interesting as, as well, because if somebody has more variability in their answers, even if they have the same mean and the same relationship to the variable, you're going to get more variability in their scores. And that means they just have a wider range of possible answers, even if they have the same average. Okay. And that's uh, interesting to know. And so to show that it's added uh, error variances, so we've got and we're also working down the output. That's totally unintentional, but we are. So we're working from um, loadings here to intercepts to now variances have numbers as well. Um, it doesn't print out the whole label for you because otherwise, obviously, these would overlap with something or, oh, actually, they don't overlap. Just the way it added them. Okay. So everything looks pretty good. Let's add that to our fit table here. And we can see under our strict one, this is where it stops working. Okay. So the difference between the CFI for the scalar model and the CFI for the strict model is 0 .001, 0 0 0.014. Which implies that these models are different. Okay, so it's greater than 0.01, uh, and if I'm going to use that rule, I now have to figure out what can I do to investigate where these models are different. So this is kind of like ANOVA, like if it's significant, then you look at the group differences and you run your little t-tests until you find where they were different. Okay. That sounded very p-hacking. You run your planned t-tests so that you can investigate your hypothesis better. <laughs> uh, here, same question. I've got all these items, which one is it? So I have to figure out where it went wrong. Okay. Then we could examine partial invariance, and partial invariance is where we figure out if the model still pretty well fits, if it's just like one or two items that are particular to keep in mind of. Okay. And that really is a useful metric for scoring procedures. So if you know that items three and four are way different than for men and women, you might come up with different cutoff scores or you might just take that into consideration. So let me show you partial invariance. And the proof, I knew what the model was doing, right? So loadings, intercepts, and residuals. I'm really leaving this here so that um, if you didn't want to do the same order of steps that I am doing, you could change the order yourself. So I'm doing loadings, intercepts, and residuals. And this particular model, strict.error.residuals, I think is the only one that had that combination. Okay. There is one called fit.residuals. 
but it was not what I wanted. So let's see here. What we can do, uh, oh, we can just look at them here. So there's fit.strict.residuals, that's the one I wanted, and fit.residuals. So I started there. And so I did conventional sim, one output, fit dot residuals, right? I'm gonna do at call, just so I can see what it's doing. You can also look at the output, but I find this a little easier. So group dot equal is only loadings and residuals. So it's actually completely skipped intercepts. And I wanted to do loadings, then intercepts, then residuals. So I knew this wasn't the right one for me. And so then I was like, well, the only one other one that says residuals is fit.strict. Let's try that. Okay. And so you could go through these to see which one has the combination you want, or you could write your own. Okay. And so that's why I've been showing you kind of, this is how I figured out which one was the one I was interested in using. So now we can see that this, in this last step, we have a difference in models. Now we have to figure out where okay. and fix the model if we can. So when you do this next partial invariance step, you only want to do it in the model that is broken. So you don't really look at the loadings. We don't look at the intercepts because those are broken, so don't fix them. Uh, here, the model that's broken is the residuals. So let's look at those. So this is where I had to figure out what level I want. So for metric invariance or for loadings, you would look for the equals tilde outputs. For a scalar, for intercepts, it would be name tilde one, because that's the code for intercepts in Levon syntax. And then for variance, it's name tilde tilde name again. Okay. So this is where you get into the left-hand operator on the left-hand side. So in a metric one, the, the left-hand side or the, the left side here would be the name of the factor tilde equals tilde, and then the loading name, RS1, RS2. For scalar, it would be the name of the measured variable, RS1, tilde 1. And then for strict, what we'll see is like RS1, tilde, tilde, RS1. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn them on and off like little light bulbs. I'm going to turn the first one and make it um, free it is the terminology, which means don't require that they be equal across groups. See what happens? Turn it back off. Turn on number two, turn it back off. Turn on number three, etc. So we are testing them one at a time. We don't test, you don't turn on one and then turn on two and then turn on three. It's, this part's not additive. Okay. So to do that, because otherwise that means running 14 different little models, this is the part that sim tools used to automate and I'm very sad they do not do it anymore. So instead I hacked it myself and so in, if let's say you, there was one model one time I ran where we had like 47 items so I would have had to run 47 different models and you just don't want to do that because that is just cry time. So what we're going to do is kind of cheat and use a loop and I know there are people out, you know, out there don't loop L apply or whatever. I like loops. This runs fine. Good code is code that runs. It does what you want it to do. So don't at me out there. Um, so I'm gonna save these as partial syntax. Okay. And what I've done to recreate the residual codes is paste the column names for all of my variables. And so in the master data set, that's four through 17. Then I pasted tilde tilde for the residuals, and then I pasted them again. So they end up looking like this. Okay. And that's the Levon code for error variance one, error variance two, et cetera. From that, I created just a little li a little vector that has a length of the number of items that I have. And this is just a holding cell from the numbers we're going to put into it. And then I just, for my own personal use, added the names. And that is why they're printed out here at the top, so I could read it better. So it's not just one, two, three, four. If you've never done a for loop in your life, you will survive. But what I'm going to do is for i in one to length. So this is going to count up to the number of items. So it's going to do number one, number two, number three, number four, okay, all the way up to 14. And it's going to loop over those and call i the number. So i is number one, number two. Some people like sequence along. I first learned Perl, so this is my wheelhouse. 
So I'm going to count up from 1 to 14 because the partial syntax is 14 columns long. I'm going to run my CFA. So this is where it helps to know what the code that it's supposed to run is. Um, so I'm cutting and pasting the code that it ran in the last step, and I'm adding one new piece here. We add group.partial equals, and it's adding that partial syntax, right? So RS1 tilde tilde RS1. Um, the little I here tells it which one to do. So it'll run the first one, which is number one, then the second one, which is number two, three, four, five, and it's pulling that I from up here. And that I just counting up one at a time. So it runs the model, allowing each item to be free one at a time. And then I just pull, because CFI is what I want. You could save the entire model if you wanted to. And I might for paper if I had to use it for something. But for this demonstration, I'm just going to save all the CFIs. And then I just printed them all out. So this is the CFI for every model releasing that constraint. And what that means is that for each model, RS1 can now be estimated separately for group one and group two. It does not require that they be the same. That is super duper handy. Now I can look at all of these and figure out which one I want to use. And that doesn't mean a whole lot until I come over here, I turned off scientific notation, and then I just did some subtraction. So I did the CFI list minus the CFA, does not let me highlight very well here, the CFI from the last model. Decrease equals true, puts the highest one first. So this is in decreasing order, which one improves the model the best? So if I release RS9, if I let it be free and do whatever it's gonna do, what we'll see is that we'll get a CFI improvement of 0.003. And so I could figure out, okay, 0.03, it was 0.014, so I actually probably need to release those two, and they're pretty much the same, they're pretty equal, 0 0.03, 0 0.0904. So I should probably do both of them together, but I would love to do these one at a time. And so this gives me the order that I need to work through. This is uh, essentially what the partial invariance function used to do. And, um, would recommend them based on this um, modification and to see one at a time. All right, so how do I fix it now? I've told you which one. We're gonna run that big old model again. Although I don't really, I could run a tiny model, but if this is say, let's say this is the scalar step, and then you still want to run the next one after that, you wanna run strict invariance, it's better if you run this huge model that's gonna run all of them because uh, at group dot partial won't affect the first steps. So it's only gonna affect the step that this actually is used in. So this is not gonna affect metric or scalar invariance in any way because that option is already not constrained. But if let's say I'm trying to fix a loading problem and then go on and test the rest of them, um, I would uh, want to use this giant function again because then it would test the rest of them with that loading problem fixed. So I just found it easier to rerun the whole thing even though I don't need those first steps again just because it would allow me to make sure that whatever order of um, invariance testing I'm using, I'm then controlling for that releasing um, for later steps. In this example, it's the last step, but if it was the first step, then we would be controlling for it. All right, so there's a lot going on here, like a lot, a lot. So we're mostly gonna skip this. Oh, I was showing you the end, the end here. I told it to be quiet this time. <laughs> so it actually only printed out the call. And you can see that it included, if I can get it down here, the um, group.partial got added here. That's all we've really done. So if I run a summary, to show you what happens here, these are all still there. Doo, 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 doo. The RS9 one is now gone. So it's actually allowing it to estimate that variance separately for each group. Okay. So I've got 2.07 here for 
women. So that's about two points on either side of a four point or on a seven point scale. Could, could go up here and look at the item. So probably two to six. Now for men, what we see is that it's much lower. So women are more variable in their answers on this question than men. Men vary about one around that average, women vary about two. Okay. And so we're, we should expect more variable answers for women, less variable answers for men. Now, when I added that to my model, what I can see is if I compare my 0.891 to 0.902, I'm not quite there. This is 0 0.11. So we need to do at least one more to get us up to what we would consider partial invariance, where it's pretty much just like the model fits all except these two and only on residuals. All right. So now I'm just going to add that to the same place I did earlier. Then I added it to my table, same steps, and I can see that I'm at 0 0.902 minus 0.894 gets me into 0 0.008, which is actually a suggested criteria, I believe, or is it 0 0.005? I can't remember. But this pulls me above the, or I'm sorry, I guess below the 0 0.01 criteria. So what I would say is that the model is invariant through scalar invariance. So the, the picture, the factor loadings, the uh, intercepts are all the same. The residuals are mostly the same, except for items nine and 13, where women have more variants. And I would go through and look at the uh, summary of this model to show that they still have more variants. On that item two, I just, I've used this example before, take my word for it, women have more variants. And so that's the summary here. It's mostly invariant. The structure of the loadings, the intercepts, most of the area invariances are the same for men and women. I could probably use this scale and trust the scores represent the same thing for both groups. Two items show larger variances, and that's the RS9 and the RS13. And women have like double the variance on these two questions. I keep interested in things and my life has meaning. So we're just more variable to answer those than uh, men are. And that would be my interpretation. There's just more range of scores for women, even though they have the same average as men. Okay. So that's all of partial invariance. And then a quick note on factor means. So there's a way to do latent means in the um, sort of steps here. But often what I want to do with latent means, I just want to know, are men and, men, men and women different? Can I get an effect size for this? And can I use that score, that factor score for something, right? Predicting in a different regression equation or um, some other analysis. Right? There's sort of three different ways to get at this. Okay. What I can do is use uh, LAV predict, so Levon predict. You put in the model you want to use. So we're going to use our very last model. So that's where this model th underscore three comes in. So we're going to use the partially invariant model. Type equals OV for observed variables. And then I um, saved that as a predicted score. So what happens in the background is that becomes two lists. It's like a, a data frame of the predicted scores for the observed variables um, for each group. Okay, let's just look at it. Oh, um, two, two tail shakes on the items. We're going to hit this button do to do to do to do to run. Okay, we'll wait two more seconds. All right, so if we run this one, what you'll see is a pretty score is a list. And I just to figure out which group was first to look to have the size of the list. So it stuck women first, whatever. So just to prove that my women group was the size I thought it was, I used a do call. This just takes those two lists, and, um, the list and slaps it together in a data frame 
I'm um, using R bind, so it creates me one data frame here of everyone, but I need to add who's men and who's women to it. So here I just repeated women 26 times and men, I'm sorry, 266 times and men 244 times. And what that does is it just adds a column in there for sex. I created a summed score. Okay, I think we normally sum these. We might average them, I don't remember. It doesn't really matter here. But I created a summed score um, and looked at those. So men and women have very equal scores on this, which isn't too surprising considering um, the loadings, the intercepts, and the residuals are mostly the same okay, without any manipulations here. However, we could also do this on the factor scores. But quick, let's look at the average on the original data set. So I used Love's predict to guess at the observed variable scores. So this recreated what it thought the, um, given the model, what does it think that the observed variable score should be for each person? So essentially recreates your data frame for you. Here, I can show that this model's pretty decent because it actually gives me almost the exact same score, which is what you want, right? So I got 63.3, and 64.2, that's pretty close. Okay, this is the original data set. Oops. You can also do love predict without that argument, type equals OV. And what that does is it actually does this on the latent variable. Okay. And so this creates us two options of latent means. Okay. The problem with the latent variable, and I did the exact same do call here to make this into a little data frame. The problem with doing it on the latent variable is it actually gives this to you in standardized scores. Um, so here's the men and women's score, which is not very helpful. Okay. Um, women are slightly below average, men are slightly below that. So what I did to get this in the scale of the data was I multiplied it by the standard deviation and added the mean. Okay, so remember the standardized scores are x minus the mean divided by standard deviation. So I just multiplied by standard deviation and added the mean to kind of undo all of that. And you'll see I get very same, very similar numbers. Okay, so you can kind of work at this from the actual latent variable scores or the other variable scores. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to look at each item, go with the observed variable scores. If you want to look at the latent means, go with the latent variable scores. And then you can pick your favorite statistic. So using the moat library, self-promotion here, I calculated the means on my predicted event, predicted scores, my observed variables. I could have done this on the latent score. It would have given me the same answer, approximately. Mean standard deviation length using t-apply. Uh, D.independent t calculates the effect size given that these are independent groups. Men and women are different groups. So mean 1, mean 2, standard deviation 1, 2, m1, n2. And it actually does give me like everything that I could possibly be interested in, but really here I'm interested in D. And this Cohen's uh, effect size is 0.05. Okay, so there's basically no difference between groups. If I look at the confidence interval for that effect size, it includes zero. And so I would pretty much argue that these have the same latent mean. Okay. And it even shows you how to print those in um, nice pretty APA format, and they're like not significantly different at all. Great. You could compare that to the projection output. So I said, hold on to this, we'll come back to it later. Here we are, 40 minutes later. <laughs> In the projection output, it actually does a latent test. That's not the same thing I just ran, but it's a very similar idea. Um, I have not quite figured out what these latent scores represent because those are not the averages for the items. So not totally sure there. I'll need to do more investigating, but look at the um, the D value here. It's very similar. Mine was like 0.04. This is, um, uh, mine was like 0.045. This is 0.036, very close, All right? And it says it's not significant. So I'm getting a very similar answer. Um, not entirely sure, like I said, what this number represents um, because that is, not the average. If I averaged all the questions instead, that's not what those were, would be. Okay. Last but very not least, you could do equivalence testing. And I'm not the authority really on this. I'm just now learning myself really how to do this sort of thing. 
Um, there's a couple of articles on equivalence testing kind of arguing back and forth about the best way to do it, but I changed this to true just to show you the output and it looks not so bonkers. But what you want to look for is these difference lines. So here is the, sorry, the difference between metric and combined groups, which would be our metric invariance test, right? And so that chi-square uh, difference value, and it prints, this prints really poorly. Let's come over here. Oh, rude. Let's try it one more time. Takes a minute to run. And then we can pop this little table out. Boop, boop. Here we go. So here's that difference score. So uh, now that you can read it better, the difference in chi-square, which is just a subtraction, um, is not significant. So it's actually testing if those chi-square values are, are different from each other and gives you the p-value, which is um, similar to what uh, I was doing. I, could, I suggested you could do. And then it also gives you some estimates um, for 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.08, 0 0.10. Uh, I would tell you to read a little bit more about how equivalence testing works to know which one you should use. Um, but the recent paper suggested to focus on the kind of chi-square differences here. And it actually suggests a slightly different answer. So if we look at metric difference and then scalar difference, scalar is actually pretty different. So it would argue that we should have figured out what was wrong at scalar, even though our um, CFI did not suggest that we look at that step. And it actually comes up with a, a title for the goodness of fit here. So close right? uh, and then mediocre for that uh, scalar invariant step. So they actually do give you slightly different answers, um, which isn't too surprising. Uh, and so I would tell you before you started your analysis to pick which metric you're going to use and just run with it the whole way. Um, but this package actually was designed to do this equivalence testing stuff. Um, so I would tell you to look at that if you're interested in doing some of the newer equivalence testing. This package will run that for you and then um, you can decide kind of for yourself which metric you want to use. All right, so I wanted to say thanks for listening to this very long video about multigroup fact confirmatory factor analysis. So now you should be able to run those in the brown steps or modify for your own. And you could also look at equivalence testing steps and estimate latent meets.